once more I must ride with my knights to defend what was and the dream of what could be. Orphans of the Sky, Understanding a Forgotten Past. Defenders of the mainstream account will allude to the fact that there are numerous libraries across the land which contain the totality of a compendium of human knowledge which is cataloged in these great books. And yet there are many competing and conflicting perspectives, even amongst the mainstream, to discern exactly what happened. What are the true events of our history? In this exploration, we're going to concern ourselves with an alternative account, and we're going to look at what some of these works of what may be fiction, or might be non-fiction, tell us about our distant past. We begin with the account of Sky Cities, A Lost Wonder. And here in this image you can see that was taken in China several years ago that shows us a city in the clouds. Now this could well be a doctored or an altered image, but it does give us the idea of the wonder of a city existing in the clouds. And why are we focusing on this? Because there are many accounts of cities that once existed in the clouds. And of course I'll start with the most obvious example from non-fiction. Isn't it funny how we call non-fiction the actual historical account? as opposed to fiction, or in this case, science fiction. Science fiction being a numerous group of stories that displayed or depicted sky cities. And why are sky cities so alluring to us? Because they show an element of fantasy and imagination that is not something that we encounter in our day-to-day -day activities. Now, of course, we're informed by the mainstream that there has been many different designs and proposals to have floating cities or very large floating structures such as the floating fortress island which the United States military has proposed over the last 20 years. But with this concept of sky cities we're actually looking at the very impressive architecture and structures that could defy gravity. Not only are they just floating on the water but they would be floating on the air. And you might be surprised to know that there are numerous mythical and legendary accounts that allude to sky cities. Indeed, even the one in Gulliver's Travels. And of course, we always remember our favorite floating head from our unique science fiction movie from the 1970s, John Borman's Zardoz. But perhaps the most unique implementation of sky cities is that they display a very advanced technology. That if you had the capacity to build and operate sky cities, how exactly would they sustain themselves in the air? What would be their power sources? And how would they defy the very means of being pulled back to the land? Or gravity, or whatever scientific explanation you're going to go with for what actually draws objects back to the ground. There are many different designs and possibilities, though, for the designs of these unique sky cities. And they tend to incite our imagination as to other possibilities for existence. Imagine what kind of existence that we could have as a civilization if we were able to achieve sky cities. Now, going to the example of Gulliver's Travels, one of the things that Gulliver's Travels concerned itself with was the possibility of a utopian or a dystopian civilization. My particular mindset is that if a civilization goes about pursuing the perfect existence, then perhaps that's one of the sure paths to it being a dystopian existence. And you might find that a little bit of a conflict in terms or ideals, but I'll explain. When a civilization devotes itself to the pursuit of a utopian existence from the society or the group's perspective, then it is certain that it will create a society or a civilization that does literally make it a dystopia for the individual. And you can find no shortage of examples of that in both science fiction and non-fictional studies, including our actual history. Now, the other interesting thing about sky cities is how exactly would they operate? How would they exist in concert? Or would they not need to exist in concert? We also consider the numerous examples that we have of city-states in our official historical account. We're told that many of the early civilizations relied on the account of city-states. Now, this could simply be the fact that they were walled cities, such as Athens in ancient Greece from the mainstream historical account. Or could this be alluding to a different existence? And you might be surprised to know that when you look into accounts of certain myths from various cultures across the land, there's not one I can cite because there's many examples, they do speak of floating islands, floating cities in the sky. Now, these can easily be dismissed as legend or myth, and they have no veracity or historiosity within them, and that may well be true. 
But once again, it's another one of those ideas, another one of those creative concepts that's repeated far too often to be ignored. And why is it repeated? Is it because it's such an alluring and attractive idea to the concept of establishing cities in the sky? Or was there some reality on it which it was based? Now, oftentimes we tend to associate what's in the sky with divine beings, or indeed the very concept of heaven itself, or the paradise that everyone wants to ascend to once their mortal life ends. At least that's in most of the primary religious beliefs. But what if there was a little bit more to this? A reality of an entire civilization that had once existed in the sky, that had the ability to use their technology to establish such wondrous structures, and then consider these entire constructions themselves. Now the mainstream tells us that the concept of sky cities is science fiction. There is no practical way to achieve this. Although there are several recent films where we have the concept of very large colossal structures that are able to defy the forces of gravity or whatever you want to consider the forces are that draw objects to the land. And perhaps one of those recent movies that you can look to is Interstellar with the concept of the evacuation of humanity with the dwindling of life and the capacity of life on Earth, at least according to that film, to sustain life. But what do these cities really point to? If they did in fact exist, they point to an entirely different form of existence. The ability of a civilization to ascend its technological advancement to where they could actually establish megastructures in the sky. Now, we have to ask the question, if these did exist, what happened to them? Could it be possible that they're in other lands? Could they be in other dimensions, separated by portals? Or did they all simply just crash back to the physical realm or the current lands that we reside on now? We don't know for sure, but we have different accounts of such things happening. And indeed, in previous explorations on this channel, and indeed several live streams, we looked at the whole principle of sky cities, or cities that manage to float in the very clouds, and not just on water. Now, comparing and contrasting that with some of the principles that we have, we can find other modern science fiction examples of sky cities, or perhaps the most well-known, Cloud City, featured prominently in Empire Strikes Back what is considered to be the finest Star Wars movie, of course. Opinions vary, and many of the current Star Wars directors will tell you that their film is the finest one. Whatever the case may be, the design and concept of Cloud City and Star Wars really gave the mainstream their first view of what a sky city could really be like. And as we understand the concept of the Cloud City that was featured in Empire Strikes Back, we understand that its entire purpose was simply to be a gas mine within what was supposed to be a gaseous planet or a gaseous environment. We saw the ability of the city to maintain itself within the clouds and to actually float and then have an entire purpose. We also saw the entire layout and the fine design and cross-section of this city which alluded to its own power source and the ability of transportation and access throughout Cloud City in and of itself. It also showed that every single portion of this city had a function, and it was indeed modeled towards efficiency. Yet it also showed that the society, the people that were living on it, lived in relative comfort. At least that's what was shown in the film. And here in this cross-section you can get an idea for how potentially complex and quite incredible this construction could be. Now, was this all just science fiction? Was this all just from creative imagination? It's entirely possible. Or could there be something else? Could there be something else within our subconscious that we were drawing upon? Some sort of suppressed memory that exists that we are only vaguely aware of. And yet, by being in touch with our creative elements of our minds, really what we're doing is we're drawing on old hidden memories. There are many different explanations, and I'm not gonna suggest that I have the answer merely suggesting other possibilities for where these wondrous creative ideas came from, because they had to start from something. They had to come from somewhere. And perhaps that's the most intriguing element when we consider sky cities, in addition to how wondrous their possibilities may be. Now, there's also several people who claim to have seen in the distant future or visualize the distant future, and they see humanity ascending to the clouds once again and living in sky cities or perhaps another version of what we would consider city-states. Because once again, how would these cities actually be connected? Well, they could still be part of an overall civilization, but each city having its own representation and its own means of existence and its own particular rituals and habits and social means and mores. 
and suddenly it gives you a lot greater flexibility to live and operate within a greater civilization. Imagine if you could simply move from one city to the next and you had the ability to experience many different environments. Now, people will say that's exactly what we have with our cities that currently exist on the land, and that is true in many respects. Of course, there's also the other opinion that states that many of our cities are vast failures, are mismanaged, and they oftentimes have quite the worst aspects of human existence within them. All these things are true, but I think one of the reasons why it's important to understand the very creative element that comes from sky cities, cloud city, or whatever you want to call these aerial structures, that they provide us a safe haven from some of the disasters that can occur on the land, such as extreme weather. And we certainly know with all of the use of the words dome that we've had over the past couple of weeks, that having a haven from the weather would be quite an interesting consideration you would no longer be affected by weather patterns. You would also be safe by the very shifting of the land, regardless of whatever the nature of the fault lines are or the earthquakes that occur, why they occur, and with what frequency they occur. Well, if you're living in a city in the clouds, if your entire civilization is in the clouds, you needn't worry about earthquakes or shifting fault lines or any of the realities that represents. And then there's numerous other forms of extreme weather that the cities would be above of. Imagine never having to worry about a tornado, or a hurricane, or a cyclone, or the terrifying typhoons that we have that afflict our lands, and all the other names that we have for our new weather patterns, whether it's a derecho, a polar vortex, and least we forget the possibility of flooding or great tsunamis that completely sweep over the land. These are all the dangers that sky cities would alleviate instantly, but they're just the idea of science fiction. Or is there more of a reality to them? What do you think? Orphans of the Sky is a science fiction novel written by one of the original American science fiction authors, Robert Heinlein. Orphans of the Sky was published in the early 1960s, although it should be noted it's a composition of two earlier works by Heinlein that were published in 1941 in Astounding Science Fiction, the magazine. What's intriguing about Robert Heinlein, in addition to being one of the very first science fiction writers who was of notoriety in the United States, is that he served as a naval officer in the 1930s, fortuitously just before the time when the United States Navy began its massive expansion. He was also an aeronautical engineer. What's interesting about Orphans of the Sky is it's one of the very first plots that deals with a generational ship. Now, granted, the setting of this novel is in space, as it's science fiction, but just imagine any sort of ship in any sort of environment traveling for generations. And part of the issues that arise in the story is the fact that there was a mutiny, and the officers, or the individuals who had knowledge of the mission and the functions of the ship, were killed. And then you were left with this crew that had to try to figure out exactly what was going on. And because of the fact that the ship was floating through space for such a long period of time, or whatever environment it was actually in, or you can imagine it being in, eventually the individuals that resided on the ship completely lost not only awareness of its functions, but its entire purpose. The original novel was called Universe because the entire ship was considered the entire world. That's how much these individuals had lost their knowledge, not only of the workings of the ship, but also of their very existence. And this is a very interesting idea, and Heinlein was one of the first ones to propose it in these novels. I also find it, again, quite a coincidence that he served the United States Navy just before the United States Navy began its large expansion for World War II and during World War II. There's the element of losing the knowledge of what your actual existence is. And this might even be a way of explaining mass amnesia. Also consider how we can compare and contrast this with our many examples that we have of civilizations that had fallen from the past. Now, mainstream history likes to inform us that we never really lose any knowledge of a civilization. There's no such thing as a true lost civilization. There's only legend and myth, and those are allegedly easy to disprove. Yet at the same time, no one will ever forget about the Roman Empire, because despite the fact that aspects of the Roman Empire and different elements of its knowledge are different categories of what was written about it was constantly rediscovered time and time again. Indeed, it's quite a recurring theme when you study history. It's why they say that historical revision is necessary to understand history, even if it's conflicting or even if the idea itself is exclusionary. 
The other interesting thing about science fiction novels, though, is they do tend to posit these unique ideas that we have of civilizations actually losing their knowledge, and the people within a civilization, or in this case, as in Orphans of the Sky, the actual crew of a ship, not only losing the understanding of the operations of the ship, but also the very existence of the ship. I can remember many discussions in class decades ago where many of the fellow students in my class could not understand how the individuals who were on the ship could be, to use their words, so stupid. Well, if you think about what could happen over generations, what kind of knowledge could be lost, depending on your environment? What if there was a knowledge that was very different concerning our current environment that we're living in right now, that was lost over time? And what if somebody else stepped in, and what if they gave an alternate explanation? Because somebody needed to have an explanation for the existence of all things, and just think on the idea that somebody stepped in and provided an alternate idea. And then as a result, because this was the prevailing idea, and those in authority supported this idea, it became the reality. Now granted, it's just a science fiction story, I'm not saying that's the reality that we're living in right now, but the idea and the plot is very intriguing because of the different dynamics of having different social groups. Indeed, the other thing that was revolutionary or new in Robert Heinlein's novel is the concept of mutants. And it should be noted that since he wrote this in the very early 1940s, in fact, before the United States entry into World War II, even nuclear or atomic power, as it was referred to, was at that time still only a theory and had not been put into practical application, at least as we understand it from official publications. But that's the interesting thing about science fiction novels, is did they really predict upcoming technology, or were the authors simply on the cutting edge, such as when we did our exploration of Jules Verne? Jules Verne didn't suggest a generation ship, but perhaps he did. Perhaps it was in writings that weren't published. Or did Jules Verne even exist? All these potential realities may be possible. But whatever the ideas are that these science fiction authors shared with us, they could have simply come from their creative imagination. But where were they inspired? How were they inspired? The answer tends to be, well, they simply look to earlier science fiction authors, or they look to fantasy, they look to fairy tale, and they tried to combine them or amalgamate them. There's also a great terror that tends to appear in science fiction novels, and yet we oftentimes see this terror existing in our collective conscience. There's no shortage of apocalyptic science fiction material that's been pushed on the mainstream. Indeed, you can find many of the most popular fictional stories involve an apocalyptic account of some sort. So while it's popular, it also results in a societal-wide fear. A fear of the loss or the fall of civilization. Is that because there really was a loss of civilization? Well, the mainstream will corroborate this by saying that, yes, Rome fell, there were other civilizations that fell. Although they, again, indicate that it's a very minimalized event, and it's not necessarily something that we should take seriously, because of the fact that it was already a corrupt civilization, it practiced forced labor, and it needed to fall. It needed to fall so the world could revolutionize its society and become a much better place after hundreds of years of feudalism and other interesting forms of government. At least that's what the mainstream will tell us. But we can find no shortage of creative ideas, and whether it's on the extraordinary technological advancements or the very terrifying descents of what society or even the horror of technology could offer us. It's certain to say that H.G. Wells believed that technology was the answer to all of life's problems, and if you want to see how far he took that idea, watch the 1936 film Things to Come which H.G. Wells had an inordinate amount of influence as the writer. He essentially had total creative control over the film. And let's move on from science fiction to another exploration of War of the Worlds, going to H.G. Wells, Invaders from Other Lands. We're not going to explore H.G. Wells' original work, though. We've covered it before. We are going to examine, though, a different account of it, which is War of the Worlds, the 1980s TV series. Now, to understand the TV series, you actually have to go back to the 1950s film. War of the Worlds in the early 1950s was a science fiction film that basically updated and evolved the story a little bit that H.G. Wells had told, and supposedly involved an invasion from extraterrestrials that were from Mars, although it should be noted that the 1950s film was a lot more ambiguous and ambivalent about the actual origin of the invaders. 
Well, this continuity, at least the story in the 1950s film, the invaders fell victim to the bacteria that was present on Earth, or the land that we reside on, and they didn't die, but they were simply in a deep sleep. And the government then contained all of these invaders, these aliens, whatever you want to call them, in isolated compounds, and also seized their technology and stored it as well. And everyone just seemed to forget that it all happened. Again, another idea of this mass amnesia of a population forgetting a very cataclysmic event. And the interesting thing about the TV show, which initially aired in 1988-89 in the first season, they talked about how the population had completely forgotten about this very overt invasion which had threatened the very existence of humanity. Yet the governments of the land at that time managed to hide away all these aliens in 55-gallon drums and store all of their remaining technology in various sites and secure military installations. The TV series was very horrifying in its own respect, and despite the fact that they had a very limited budget, they managed to make a lot of creative ideas and choices that made the aliens quite frightening. For example, once the aliens start to woke up or start to wake up, they had the ability to take over human bodies and possess humans. There was a problem though because the aliens needed to constantly bathe themselves with radiation so they wouldn't fall victim to the bacteria which had caused them to fall into a hibernation. This was the official plot explanation for why the alien invasion in the 1950s was unsuccessful and why they revived in the late 1980s, according to the show's continuity. Many of the plots of the first season of the show dealt with the aliens using very unique methods of subterfuge to try to undermine the humans. And indeed, the governments of humanity do not take the alien threat very seriously. What we understand in the plot is that the aliens are preparing the way for a second wave, a larger invasion from their homeland or home planet. It's oddly enough ambivalent as well. There are some individuals, though, such as the members of the National Guard pictured here in this particular episode, who do have a memory of the original alien attack. And they even tie it back into the original Orson Welles broadcast of War of the Worlds in the 1930s. So many interesting and intriguing ideas in the first season of this show. And if you watch it now, some people say that it has a little bit of a repetitive nature, and while this may be true, it really gave you the impression of this existential terror that was also operating beneath the waves, in a way that they weren't readily apparent. For example, one of the plots that the aliens attempted is they would take over the bodies of various EMTs, emergency medical services, and then they would use those to collect humans for further experimentation. A very terrifying idea, and also the show making use of its limited budget to present something that the aliens were constantly a threat. The fact that the Blackwood team, which was merely a team of four regular humans, and they were sponsored by the government trying to dissuade and disrupt these aliens' activities, and yet they were minimally resourced. There was something that felt very oddly real and terrifying about this story perhaps because of the fact that the limited budget was actually used as a strength to make this TV series feel a lot more realistic. There was another episode where the aliens, who always operate in threes, and their command group was called the Advocacy, and this was a group of three aliens. One of them fell sick, and they lost their ability to make decisions. So there were some very interesting rules that were established about the aliens, and indeed this world that they lived in in the first season. Well, efforts were made where the aliens actually had to seize human brains and then use them with some interesting technology to heal the third alien of the advocacy, restoring them to a full functionality. The series had a lot of many different elements of terror, and it had a thriller ending towards the end of the first season, where it seemed as though there was an entirely different group of aliens, or creatures from another land, however you want to think of it, that were going to threaten the original aliens, and yet they had malevolent purposes as well as they simply desired to destroy humanity or use humanity as a food source, and therefore they wanted to defeat the more taxons. The other recurring plot element is the aliens attempting to recapture or re-implement the technology that they had lost in the 1950s with the ray guns that they had on their mantis or their tripod walkers, although they flew in the film version, and used them to overwhelm humanity. I think one of the reasons that this TV show, which unfortunately was lost in the second season, it did make it to the second season, but they changed out the producer and the creative team, and the second season just wasn't the same as the first season. It had some interesting ideas, and is even credited as being an element of the genre of cyberpunk. 
but unfortunately it lost a lot of the elements of existential terror and the subterfuge in the first season. It did depict the interesting decay and collapse of human society, possibly because of the war, although for reasons unknown or unstated. Many of the interesting plot elements that had been recurring throughout the first season were dropped into the second season, and many of the popular characters, such as Colonel Paul Ironhorse, didn't survive to the second season. And so as a result, the show lost a lot of the fan interest and was quietly pulled out after the second season. But I think one of the reasons why this was a popular show, and why it's still well remembered to this day, is it shows the efforts of just regular people to try to stop the efforts of some sort of invading existential force, and it contained a lot of interesting ideas. It also made a wondrous use of its limited budget by constantly making the stories feel real, as though this was something that could happen right in front of you. And there was never any shortage of terrorizing elements of the aliens. There's also the fact that, for television standards at the time, it tended to push the limits of violence and terror that was shown on TV at that time. Of course, it would be considered very mundane to viewers in this particular day, as standards constantly change. But it's something to keep in mind with how the perception of violence and terror has changed over time. It's also interesting to note that many of the tactics that the aliens used would be considered tactics that would be found abhorrent by what we consider as modern terrorist organizations to this day. So many different interesting ideas, and unfortunately this show was scrapped in the second season, where one of the wonderful plot ideas of having multiple alien civilizations that were competing for Earth to use as natural resources was simply scrapped, and we went back to the original aliens. And then we overlap the idea of human civilization collapsing while it was happening at the same time. Perhaps the best thing I can say for the second season of War of the Worlds is it did give us an early look at Adrian Paul. And Adrian Paul pretty much improves anything that he's in, and I would argue that he's the entire reason that Highlander the series was as successful, or in that fact successful at all, because of his presence. But we'll move on from War of the Worlds and look at Mass Amnesia a fresh canvas for new accounts. The, si the salient mystery of dark ages sets the stage for mass amnesia. People living in vigorous cultures typically treasure those cultures and resist any threat to them. How and why can a people so totally discard the vital culture that it becomes vitally lost? And that's from Jane Jacobs. And Jane Jacobs was an activist who actually tried to resist the efforts of urban renewal because she looked at the concepts of urban renewal affecting the people that really lived in cities. And at the end of the day, she was trying to preserve old world structures and buildings, and indeed, she did succeed in many cases. Although at the time, she was derided because she was a woman who was trying to stand up against social progress. We look at other examples of mass amnesia, mass amnesia such as in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, where we see an example of what may be a cargo cult with the survivors of the plane flown by Captain Walker, a 747 that evacuated an Australian city before a nuclear strike, and the plane was ultimately brought down by a nuclear strike. We also compare and contrast how mass amnesia can occur within civilizations because of a loss of knowledge. Now, what ends up happening when you have a loss of knowledge, and let's say you completely lose what the official objective account was, you'll have others that'll step in, and they'll try to fill in the blanks of the account. They may be correct, they may not be correct. It's not to say that there's even an intentional effort, or the terrifying word conspiracy, to subvert what the objective account is. It can happen completely by accident. For example, these bones. How did these bones get here in this image? Where did they come from? Who were these people? Of course, we'll be told that science can use its methods and find out exactly how old the bones were, find out exactly what strata that they're located in. They can use a combination of many different scientific disciplines and tell us everything that we need to know about the bones and the society and the culture that they came from. And yet, if that's the case, then why do we even bother with written accounts? What What's the point of using written accounts, whether they're tablets, whether they're cuneiform, whether they're scrolls, or whatever their origin is, to actually document our civilization and our society? Why don't we just use science in every single case? Because isn't science supposed to be unbiased and objective? Aren't these other disciplines supposed to give us a perfect example of what our civilization or our society really was? And yet we oftentimes use a mix. 
For example, Mary Beard, the wondrous historian who could write incredible papers. And I will admit, Mary Beard is an exceptional communicator, probably one of the very best communicators you will ever come across, whether it's in the, in the written word, and she's also a wonderful orator. And her field of expertise is antiquity, or classical Rome. And then we also look at Carl Sagan, the former scientific contributor of this channel. And Carl Sagan knew everything about space and the cosmos. And he never even had to go to space or the cosmos, just like Mary Beard had no way to ever go to Rome of antiquity or the classical period, because obviously it existed long before she was ever alive. So Mary Beard was reliant on the writings of others. She was reliant on the books and the commitment of the knowledge to paper, as Carl Sagan liked to say. And as a result, what if somebody along the way had changed something or altered something? I'm not saying anybody would do so intentionally, but it's not as though Mary Beard could go consult the Guardian of Forever and actually watch the proceedings of events in classical Rome to know what really happened or what really didn't happen. She's reliant on those writings and how accurately they were captured at the time, and not only captured at the time, but then transmitted through different civilizations, different cultures, and different governments, which current history tells us are corrupt. Unless you want to believe that Mary Beard jumped into the DeLorean and went back into time that way, and then she was able to verify what actually happened in Rome during these time frames that she studies, and knows exactly what Augustus was eating on that night when he ordered the response to the massacre of the three legions in Germania. Or maybe she actually had to use a Reliant Robin because you know, she was actually in the UK. And, you know, a Reliant Robin being a three-wheeled car, when you turn it over, it actually has the effect of taking you back in time. It's more effective than a DeLorean. And all kidding aside, that's something we have to remember, though, is how exactly do these individuals, these wonderful intellectuals who gain information from the past, for example, if you're going to study Rome, this is an individual you come across, Tacitus. Tacitus supposedly wrote about many different accounts to include the crucifixion of Christ, although it should be noted that Tacitus wasn't born until well after the crucifixion of Christ, so he wasn't even a first-hand account. And yet you'll see many statues that show Tacitus, and I guess you could say that this statue could be anybody. I mean, the fact that we've got a beard going on here, this could be a U.S. Civil War general just by basis of the beard alone. I don't know, if you add the Glasgow smile, you might have Tommy Flanagan, and you might even have James McAvee if you want to take the Scottish touch on the statue. And Cornelius Tacitus said Christ suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius by Pontius Pilate. Again, Tacitus did not witness these events firsthand. He was merely transmitting other events. And keep in mind, this was nearly 2,000 years ago. So that's something we have to remember is that these accounts were captured and they were transmitted over different civilizations. We have to remember that we've had different institutions that, tr that have tracked the information. And whether it was Josephus, who we're told was a citizen of Judea and Jewish and ended up defecting to the Roman Empire. Yes, doesn't that seem odd? I guess he's kind of like... Uh, Admiral Jarok was in Star Trek The Next Generation. Very odd that a Romulan would ever want to defect, yet we have that account. And supposedly he was a reliable historian of the Jewish wars that occurred during the time frame of the 100s. Isn't it also interesting that in Roman coinage we virtually never see a year? But perhaps they just didn't need it. You know, if you have a likeness of the emperor on the coin, then you should be able to know what the year was because we know beyond any shadow of a doubt what the reigns were. But again, it goes back into questioning the very history. How certain are we on its accuracy and its authenticity? 2,000 years is a long time. How many different civilizations and how many different times have we been told that we had to recover the records of Rome? And while we have very wondrous communicators such as Mary Beard and Carl Sagan, what could they really tell us? And that's why we question the records of civilization. Most of our studies center around the Reset War the transition from what we call the fourth era to the fifth era. And that's because of the limitations that we have. The foundation eras are quite frankly mythical or legendary to us. And keep in mind that even if we did have an accurate account or what we thought was an accurate account, we have to remember that they pass through other civilizations. They pass through other caretakers, other recorders, other institutions who preserve the knowledge. How effectively did they preserve it? Or did they get it confused? Did they get it wrong? This is why we have to remember that even the objective study of history is very difficult. And also recall that in our 48 Laws of Power by author Robert Greene, he talks about the most important law being do not outshine your boss. 
Indeed, Galileo was known to name the moons of Jupiter after the most powerful family, the Medicis, at that time. And why did he do this? To gain their favor. Well, if the Medicis said there weren't going to be any planets, then would Galileo have not actually found any planets? Would he have altered his findings so he could fall into their favor? Who's to know and who's to say? But what are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.